Hello, good morning. Welcome to Newsdex with me, Ernest Tamino. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, President Kufado questions the structure of the global economy, insisting it greatly puts emerging economies at a greater disadvantage. We'll bring you some details and hear from an economist. Suspect named in connection with the murder of prospective nurse in uh, Mankasim to appear before court. We have details for you. And also, uh, Ghana cannot prosper unless NPP and NDC politicians tackle socio-economic well-being of citizens instead of focusing on the political fortunes of their parties. That's according to policy analyst Dr. Steve Mantia. Why? Stay tuned for details. We have that plus the latest in business, sports, all coming up in this bulletin. Please stay with us. Hello again, many thanks for choosing us. Now, President Ikufado has questioned the structure of the global economy, insisting it greatly puts emerging economies at a greater disadvantage. In an address at the United Nations General Assembly, the president made a strong case for global commitment towards alleviating what he urged or argued is a crisis caused by mainly the Russian-Ukraine war, as well as COVID-19 and structures that work against African economies. He's calling for urgent steps to deal with economic turmoil. Credit rating agencies have been quick to downgrade economies in Africa, making it harder to service our debts. The tag of Africa as an investment risk is little more than in substance a self-fulfilling prophecy created by the prejudice of the international money market, which denies us access to cheaper borrowers, pushing us deeper into debts. During times of crisis, the facade of international cooperation under which they purport to operate disappears. We do not have the luxury of being able to pick and choose which problem to solve. None of them can wait. The economic turbulence requires urgent and immediate solution. By 2021, COVID-19 had pushed Africa into the worst recession for half a century. A slump in productivity and revenue, increased pressures on spending, and spiraling public debts confronted us without relent. As we grappled with these economic challenges, Russia's invasion of Ukraine burst upon us, aggravating an already difficult situation. It is not just the dismay that we feel at seeing such deliberate devastation of cities and towns in Europe in the year 2022. We're feeling this war directly in our lives in Africa. Every bullet, every bomb, every shell that hits a target in Ukraine hits our pockets and our economies in Africa. You know, credit ratings agency Fitch is predicting more trouble for Ghana. As it says, sovereign debt default is, quote, a real possibility for the country and any kind of domestic debt restructuring could severely threaten local banking sector. Now, Ghana turned to the International Monetary Fund for help in July as it is uh, balance of payments position deteriorated. Let's get some more on this. Professor Lord Mensah uh, is an economist at the Investor of Ghana Business School and he joins us. Uh, Prophet, grateful for your time. Let's start with the president's comments. Um, would you say that is legitimate? Prof, you'd have to unmute so we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you now. What do you make of the president's comment? Yes, I think uh, you see, if you look at the market, the market is an open, I mean, place where you have to decide whether you want to buy over there or not. Mm -hmm. It's not a place that anybody will be forcing you to go and borrow or to go and, I mean, take money from Effectively, um, yes, uh, the, the market tries on information. And once information changes, I uh, mean, the investor may want to be aware of what exactly is happening. And everybody knows very well that the African continent poses, you know, more or less a threat when it comes to sovereign investment. And so um, if it turns up that um, Africa is not being treated fairly, then he can argue from... Uh, the point of the premium that is being required by investors to invest in Africa, i.e. looking at the possible 
excess returns beyond the so-called safe countries that investors are looking out for. Usually, the margins are around 5% to maybe, I think, um, 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 10%. That's a difference. Normally, they, they use America as um, the safe haven. And effectively, any investor will be looking at the returns beyond what they can get from a safe haven like America. So um, it is a market that is open. You have to decide whether you may want to borrow from that market or not. Mm. But as to whether you know, the market is prepared to adjust, you know, to say that though um, our conditions in Africa, I mean, is different. So we should, you know, um, the market should consider uh, as far as, I mean, returns and risk is concerned and the way that the, the credit rating agencies, I mean, treat us. I mean, those rating agencies deals with information. And once the situation changes, they have to upgrade for investors to be aware. It's a way of you know, managing the global integrated risk in total. Right. So if your situation changes and they, they don't upgrade it, um, they may put, you know, uh, something bad in the eyes of, you know, the investor. So effectively, that is how the market works. You have to decide whether you will go there to borrow or not. Uh, but, but you agree that there's some merit in what he's saying. And we've had government uh, over the last few months uh, respond in some some strong words uh, sometimes to these uh, rating agencies when they release uh, their reports um, uh, or their ratings of our, uh, our debt situation and of course our credit worthiness. Uh, would you say that the consistent well, uh, the consistent response uh, will be a way of of, of you know sending some message uh, to the market that we are aware of the situation. Uh, but also there's some bit of unfairness, and so you must adjust in order to accommodate us. Well, for that one, I don't buy into it. These things are dynamic, you know. We've had riches that sometimes they upgrade us to be B+, plus, in some cases to be B-, minus. sometimes we shift. It's a transition. And once your economy evolves and your economy changes, you'll be getting this kind of response. Well, it appears that uh, we lost uh, Professor Lord Mensah there via Zoom. Uh, we're working to uh, reconnect to him uh, to have his thoughts on the uh, president's concern raised at the UN General Assembly, uh, where he's questioning the fairness of the international uh, financial market and all the rating agencies, especially in these uh, difficult times. For him, he believes uh, these uh, systems, the structures, are skewed uh, to the disadvantage of Africa. Ghana, obviously, is in some economic challenges and that uh, we are turning to the IMF for a program. Uh, but let's go back to Zoom now and hear from uh, Professor Lord Mensah. We, we, we lost you briefly, Prof. Well, we seem not to have uh, Professor Lord Mensah still with us on the line, but also this morning uh, we're hearing from Fitch uh, that is warning against any form of debt restructuring. Uh, Fitch is warning that that will have some consequence for the local banks. You know that government holds a lot of its bonds with the uh, local banks. Some of them have actually been downgraded uh, as a result of that. Um, it is further warning that any form of restructuring will come back to hurt the economy because the banks will suffer. Just yesterday, we heard from the Bankers Association making the point that they are committed to uh, making sure that they fund businesses. Uh, they made some five billion supports to the U-Start program of government. Um, let's go to the phone now and speak to Professor uh, Lord Mensah. Prof, we lost you briefly uh, when you were making the point about uh, you know government uh, retort to some of these uh, rating, ratings. When these uh, agencies come to you know, rate us from government. I mean, it's not good. I mean, it throws more uncertainty to the investor because the investor tries on information and the consistency of the information is very, very important. So what the rating agency is putting out there is based on your economic parameters. It's based on your ability to pay your debt. So if you respond in a manner to say that um, the rating agencies are not being fed to you, and as a result of that, the market should consider 
I don't think um, it's a good call. Um, what we need to understand is that economies go through transition. We go through processes. And as we sit here, sometimes we compute the chances of an economy going into a negative or being, you know, going to a positive. So effectively, I can tell you that um, it's not a good call, but rather shows more uncertainty to the face of the investor. And mm -hmm. that could even affect us, you know, going forward in a, in a manner that we assess. Right. You know, the, the, the international market. Mm. The, the second aspect of our conversation this morning has to do with our debt levels. Uh, Fitch again is warning that any form of restructuring will hurt the economy because local banks will be affected. I mean, one of the things that you economists have said is that we need to restructure our debt. It is one of the reasons we are heading to the IMF, hoping that it will give us the space to be able to do that. Uh, but with this warning coming from Fitch, how can government navigate this very uh, difficult, uh, you know, rope? Yeah, I mean, debt structuring, um, restructuring is inevitable. Because um, looking at our situation now, um, we cannot keep on, you know, being under such pressure to satisfy our interest obligations and all those. So it is something that uh, we, 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 we may have to look at. But, you know, to, 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 to look at the, the impact on you know, the local market, I would say that, yes, the local market may need some sacrifice in that regard because we don't go through this restructuring to position the economy in such a way that um, the, the economy will start picking up and that will, you know, yield to the benefits of the, uh, the bank. I don't think we, there will be a head. So um, that would be the best way for us. But we hope and uh, we are pressed in terms of payment. Uh, if we go through restructuring, it will give us some briefing space in the, in, the, in the medium term, and mm. so, so that we can deal with the situation for the uh, economy to pick up again. And so you think that we should go ahead with the restructuring, but, but then what happens locally would be another effect that we'd have to deal with. How, do, how should the banks position themselves and perhaps the BOG uh, you know, put in place some measures to help us deal with the shocks? Yes, of course, uh, the banks are understanding the dynamics and uh, knowing what is found to happen in the, in the, in the next uh, few I mean, years, if we should go for the uh, restructuring, to also position themselves and know very well that, I mean, dealing with the government, over-concentration of government loans on their balance sheet uh, may not necessarily be the order of the day. And possibly look at the private sector and how they can do retail banking. Right. Thank you very much for your time. That's Professor Lord Mensa. He's an economist at the University of Ghana Business School. He starts with arrested in connection with the killing of the 22-year-old prospective trainee nurse in Mankasim are to appear before court today. Police in Central Region have picked up the second suspect, the Tufuhene of Ekunfi Akwankrum, whose house, the body of the deceased, was exhumed. Nana Onya de Tufuhene, together with his accomplice, a pastor, is being investigated by the police for kidnapping, killing, and secretly burying Aso Boche in the chief's apartment. The arrest of the chief follows a confession by the pastor that he and the chief killed the deceased after family members failed to pay a ransom before they released uh, the deceased. The small the following report. Nana Onya Clark, the Tufuhin of Ekunfi Akakrum, one of the two suspects in the killing of a 22-year-old aspiring trainee nurse in Mankasim, was picked up at his hideout at Akakrum in the Kunfi district. This was after a pastor confessed to helping him kidnap, kill, and secretly bury the lady. After the confession, the pastor led police investigators to the location where they buried the 22-year-old lady. The pastor is said to be the boyfriend of the sister of the deceased. He is alleged to have picked the deceased after her interview at the Ankafu College of Nursing. Georgina Aso Buche went missing for three weeks. According to the family, the pastor and the chief first demanded a ransom of 15,000 Ghana cities from them before they released the deceased. The police stated that after the family failed to pay the amount, the chief and the pastor allegedly killed the lady, buried her inside the chief's kitchen for ritual purposes. On Wednesday, the Mankasim District Police Command arrested Nana Clark Onya and had him transferred to the Regional Police Command in Cape Coast to assist in investigations. 
Central Regional Crime Officer, Chief Superintendent David Jabba, confirmed the arrest and says both suspects are in regional police custody. He wants the public to give the police the maximum support to deal with miscreants in society. Such personnel were kept close. They are now in police custody. The two suspects are now in police custody. What I would tell the general public is to have faith in the police and trust that we can do a good job. You can attest to the fact that we have not slept on the job on this matter. Crime combat is a shared responsibility and not only the duty of the police. Assist our officers to deal with crime in your various areas. Mankasim ha, your able officers were ha. Mankasim district officer ni, ram officer ni. Information via ebe boa bamboro. Mumfa mao, ya debe ya juma. Na ya dia bobain, abua mankasim mai. Eni yini na ya bo. Angry residents of Mankasim are calling on the police to deal ruthlessly with the two to serve as a deterrent to others. Manchena kom. They should be stabbed and humiliated and the laws deal with them. <laughs> I am angry. If the chief were standing here right now, I would have hit him with a stone. I have nieces, and if anyone does that to any of them, I won't take kindly to it. I suggest they strip him naked, tie a rope around his mouth, and parade him through the street to serve as a lesson for others. Meanwhile, the police say the two will continue to assist them with investigations while they prepare to put them before courts. Reporting for Joy News, Richard Kwejo Cape Coast. Well, let's get some update on this story. Richard Kujunyako joins us alive. Richard, uh, the two I expected in court today. You are the police station. What can you report from there? Well, so they are in court currently. Uh, the case will be called pretty shortly. But uh, initially, we did not know the identity of the self-styled pastor. And his name is Michael Dakun, mm -hmm. a.k.a. Nanawat. He's 48 years of age and um, plies his trade. He says he plies his trade at Anomabu, and so that is where he lives. The second suspect is Christopher Akor Kwansa, and he is a Tufuhin of Aqua Chrome, and he is also popularly known as Nana Clark, and he is 65 years of, of age. And so the police prosecutors are here uh, in court, and pretty shortly the case will be called. Is it clear to us what the charges are? Well, uh, we are not privy to the charge sheet now, and the police have not also told us what exactly the charges are, but it's likely they may charge uh, them for murder, for kidnapping, and, um, and maybe um, attempted something. So we do, not, we do not really know. We are yet, but for the two, we are quite sure that there was kidnapping, there was um, an extortion of money, or they demanded ransom from their family, and then uh, they also secretly buried the, the lady. Some of the residents you spoke to uh, yesterday uh, following the uh, arrest of the chief were very much livid uh, about the uh, development. Uh, I, I can imagine that some of them will be interested in the court case today and, and will be around to monitor proceedings. So the court is part. People want to see through to the end of this matter. Yes, through their, uh, through their livid, they are destructive, they are broken, and they didn't mean worse at all. They wanted the law to even be set aside, and then some kind of punishment that, are, that may not be lawful be, um, um, be, be put on the people. Um, they should be stripped naked, paraded through the street of uh, Mankesim and its environs, so it will serve as a deterrent to others. Right, Kojo, thank you very much, and uh, we'll be keeping tabs on this story. Definitely bring uh, viewers up to speed on what transpires in court. To other stories now, and Chief Policy Analyst at the Ghana Institute of Public Policy Options, Dr. Charles Rekubo, says government achievement 
in the fight against corruption should be judged by results only and not rhetoric. Speaking in an interview ahead of the Bar Redu Memorial Lecture set for today, Dr. Rekubobe said the success of the fight must reflect in getting tangible results. A corruption. Is that to say you don't see what they see? You know, I'm, I'm an engineer by training. I'm a scientist by training. You deal with the results. Mm. You don't deal with perception. Mm. You don't deal with desires. You don't with, deal with political wishes. You don't deal with political statements or goals. If you succeed, the success should be reflected in the reduction in corruption, reduction in pilfering, reduction in the uh, misappropriation of the public press. That, for me, is what you need. You see, uh, you don't need to go out and tell everybody, I, I, I have, I'm, I have done this or I'm doing that. The same thing with the fight with Galamse, for example. I was just about to get to that. Galamse. You know, you, you can keep talking about, I mean, uh, last week I heard somebody talking about the government came out with a blueprint for fighting Galamse. Well, a blueprint that is not put on the road to actually fight right. doesn't take you very, very far. So there are a lot of uh, great noises being made. Um, it paints a good picture. You tend to convince your own that you are doing well. But you know we have a situation where I'm told, by, well, we are told by Bloomberg, for example, that up to 150,000 tons of our cocoa mm. are likely to be rejected. Mm because <clears throat> they've been poisoned by the effects of illegal mining and, mm. the, and uh, mercury, cyanide. Yeah, exactly. So not only are we seeing, seeing the failure, it's now even beginning to affect our main economic activity. Mm. And um, uh, I, I, I really think that we, we are a people that talk too much and not do enough. Mm. So the proof of the pudding, as they say, is in the eating. It's in the eating. So if you, if you want us to believe that you are really fighting corruption, mm. then let's see corruption going down in, in a realistic, palpable way so that people do not get onto radio stations or the media or make a lot of noise about how we are fighting corruption. And today's lecture comes off at 4 p.m. at the Kofi Annan India ICT Center at Bridge. The Vice President of Imani uh, Africa, Kofi uh, Bright Simmons, will be speaking on the topic buying for the public good from the public purse, redeeming Ghana's fiscal sanity in the asylum of public financial reforms. You definitely don't want to miss this. Let's do some other stories now. Our politicians are using the divide and rule tactics to control the rest of us. That's the verdict of the policy analyst, Dr. Steve Mantia. He insists Ghana cannot prosper unless NPP and NDC politicians tackle issues based on how it affects the socioeconomic well-being of citizens. Dr. Mantial made the remarks at the Ghana Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative Forum in Sunyane from where Precious Simbevore reports. We'll bring that report to you uh, later in our subsequent bulletins and hear from uh, Dr. Steve Mantial. You're watching News Today with me, Ernest Menu.
Thanks for staying with us here on Newsdex. And uh, we can now hear from Dr. Steve Mantia, who is complaining about how politicians are using the divide and rule tactics to control the rest of us. The policy analyst uh, gave this verdict and says that uh, Ghana cannot prosper unless NPP and NDC politicians tackle issues based on how it affects the socioeconomic well-being of citizens instead of their political fortunes. And he was speaking at the Ghana Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative Forum in Sunyani. Precious Semevo reports. The Bunu and Ahafo Regions Stakeholder Dissemination Forum in Sunyane was to discuss the 2019 Ghana Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative Gaiti Reports for the mining and oil and gas sectors. It also aimed at creating the required public awareness, generating interest and debate on the issues raised in the reports and pave way for stakeholder engagement on the reports as required by the EITI standard. The National Coordinator for Gaiti, al Haji Bashiru Abdul Razak, said the recommendations of the report inform policy directions of the government. Government has responded to some of the policy calls in this in the extractive center through the policy recommendations that we have been outlining in the course of the production of this report. These discussions with government on checks to be more financially responsible and accountable on the use of extractive sector revenues. We believe that it is only through this kind of sensitization and engagement among key stakeholders that the issues highlighted in the report will be disseminated. Speaking to the media, Policy analyst and co-chair of Gaiti, Dr. Steve Mantiao, said there is still more to do to optimize the benefits of natural resources extraction in Ghana. Up until now, we've managed to ensure that citizens have access to information on how our vital natural resources, and I mean gold, oil and gas, are being managed. What we haven't quite managed to achieve is that critical transition we need to make from transparency to accountability. And, and what that will entail is we want to see citizens now beginning to use the EITI report, but also the PIAC reports to demand accountability from duty bearers. It may even involve going to court sometimes where it is revealed in this report that uh, the Minister of Finance or whoever, whichever public office holders has blatantly flouted the law. We could go to court and seek a mandamus to compel the minister to do what he has to do. He said discussions on issues and policies that affect the socio-economic well-being of citizens are lost by politicians in the interest of their political fortunes. He noted that until both the NPP and NDC members speak against the ills of government, the country cannot prosper. Today, I dare say that our politicians are using divide and rule to control the rest of us. And so when there's an issue on the table that affects the socioeconomic well-being of the ordinary citizen, rather than to look at it uh, from the perspective of how we are affected, we begin to look at it from the perspective of how it affects, the issue affects our poli the political fortunes of the parties we belong to. First and foremost, to recognize we are Ghanaians before we are party followers. And so when there's an issue on the table, let's look at it as Ghanaians. And, and, the, and the day we begin, both NDC followers and MPP followers, begin to identify the problems and the challenges facing this country and actually point it out to the government, that will be the day we begin to see development in this country. But until we do this, and if we continue seeing things from political lenses, that this country is not going to make any headway in its development efforts. Precious Semevo, Joy News, Sunyan. Yam sellers at the Techiman Central Market have expressed concern about the current economic conditions and how it is affecting their businesses. They are calling on authorities to also regulate the usage of chemical fertilizers by farmers as the abuse of the commodity is affecting the quality of the yams produced, thereby taking a toll on their business. And as a bit has been engaging some of them and has come through with the following report. Sister Attack Oko says their sales this year compared to the previous years has been low. Uh, last year, I was 
nsu afi we se de sika sam na sia ya den 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 ntin ma dwa no atia ba fom wo to ade no kra ya nto wo betena ho sa to fo no ma e meto ma ye de ba sa na ya dwa di fo na ya so ya ko fa nyama ne firi wuram ba no na ne to na ya den 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 ma ye bi kra ya tim to boka she attributes this to the harsh economic conditions across the country, adding that prices have skyrocketed over the past few months. By the way, I have done last year, best at 10 cities, you know, and net 20 cities. Who pay job about 20 cities? So by the way, I go many many. In the last year, I bet you have 100. No crying, you know. In fact, I bet you say 800 Ghana cities and 1,000 Ghana cities. And so now, bro, sir, now we are going many many. And 70, uh, 1,007. I call uh, two thousand in a woman. I'm so last year Monica Freeman is the treasurer for the Tichiman Yam Sellers Association. Her major concern has to do with the excessive use of organic fertilizers by farmers. She says this leads to the yams going waste within a short period, rendering sellers to run at loss after buying from the farms. A queer for says the banya bathroom, no queer new one. What did you say? No, what to buy it? What did you say? Yeah, would I money? We are side of a treasure. Go buy it. Yes, that is it. San Raya. I could have four by and I'm bath for a bed. It dry. A queer cacra cracker. I am a woe. Any other drama dossing. You are not quite the bang of a sin. What are they go by? Yes, they are in the cacra cacra. When you have a house, you can buy it. I have a house. 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 Chidom Hima for a group from Nana Nyaku Abronoma on her part appealed to government to intervene and institute measures capable of controlling the use of fertilizers by farmers. Metala Kradi Asraba and say, A new Abbas is say, Ya de ya piano. Mr. Nanka Yan Kasama, Nema Bibriman at Tena, Lea de Sekane, I saw the year of Funo, Nabai Probi and Ho. A basa bag lawyer, Pakoje, Count Kuan de Bray. They are also perturbed by the indiscriminate parking of long vehicles around the yam space. And I say, well, warns city authorities to intervene as well as provide security for them. Cassia Cassia, Yakofa, I rebel good Jama. Now, drop off for the Cassia Bajina, and you move in your winner bed will be crab by one who is there by the go. Now, there's any young bamboo. Trace, you need security be a be a be any person in be our ah or her so no answer man or you are you need to any the medical coffee so I from first one so this has been the situation from the Techiman Yam market traders are lamenting some of the key issues that is actually disturbing them and their trade. My name is Anna Sabet reporting for joiners. An agricultural policy advisor has supported calls for government to wean off farmers from fertilizer subsidies. A joint police and national security operation last week saw over 500 smuggled bags of cocoa fertilizers impounded. In an interview with Joe News, Abraham Juma Odum said such policies have often been counterproductive given the lack of supervision and poor implementation. He said it is time to approach Agric as a full commercial venture. Yes. You see, for far too long, we have looked at agriculture as a developmental item. But I believe that we need to place agriculture where it has to be. Which it's is? an industry, like the IT industry. Hmm? We used to have government, P&T, telephone, blah, blah, blah. But the moment it was put into the private sector, look at how IT, I mean telephony, has gone to. So I believe that we need gradually create an environment. Government can do some kind of support, some kind of arrangement, creating an enabling environment for private sector to set themselves up and then trigger. Because, you know, why do we say that the private sector is the engine of growth? When we say the private sector is the engine of growth, we need the private sector to come and help us. 
develop the industry. Right? Mm. So, what the point I'm making is that, yes, we need to support the private uh, farmers. But let's have it as a mindset that we have goals. Mm. We are supporting up to a point. The farmers must be able to handle themselves in the long run. And that will be more sustainable than always government helping. Because, you see, the, 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 the irony of the issue is that if government is trying to help, you put money into the system, and what is happening just three days ago will happen. Money that is meant to subsidize, subsidize would end up in the private pockets. Mm -hmm. And that is what I hate. Because, I mean, how can we be so hypocritical? How can we say that we are helping the farmers? Meanwhile, what is coming out is any in the pocket of some private people. So me, helping farmers throughout their life is something that I don't think is sustainable. What we need to do, set a platform for them. Get them off. When, when we did the Cocoa High Tech, yeah. I remember at Chufupraso, there was one farmer that I was able to set up who could buy 300 bags of Asasura. And in 2003, he was the best cocoa farmer in the whole country. You're watching Newsdex with me, Ernest Mini. We're taking a break on where we Daryl will bring us the latest in business. Please stay. Hi, good morning. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The Ghana Investment Fund for Electronic Communication GIFEC, together with GIZ, has climaxed its digital skills training for entrepreneurs. Speaking to journalists after the climax and graduation ceremony at Chebi in the Eastern Region, Deputy Administrator of GIFEC, Eva Andopoku, explained that this will boost the operations of businesses. Here's more in this report. In partnership with the German corporation GIZ, the project seeks to strengthen the digital capacities of women and youth in utilizing information and communication technologies to build and expand businesses while making them ready for the job market. The Ghana Investment Fund for Electronic Communications, GIFEC, has so far trained about 2,500 youth and women in this initiative across 40 selected community ICT centers in eight regions of the country. Deputy Administrator for GIFEC, Eva Andopoku, speaking at the graduation ceremony for participants in Chibi, hinted that similar projects will be rolled out to benefit more people. We are in a digital era. And hence, and hence, it's absolutely necessary that we leave no one behind, um, especially um, after the aftermath of the COVID. We realize that um, everywhere you go, people use ICT to communicate and do all sorts, and it's actually proven to be a source of economic development in various countries and globally, if I should say. Speaking on behalf of GIZ, Stephanie Huber highlighted the importance of the project to the growth of local economies. The digitalization of the Ghanaian economy provides a huge opportunity for the country to leapfrog the provision of efficient public services such as health, education, revenue generation, creating of new jobs for the growing unemployment use, protecting human rights and freedom. These opportunities are some of the reason why the Digital Transformation Center, shortly DTC, has been set up. Its goal is to provide the support to the digital transformation agenda of Ghana. Some beneficiaries also share their experiences 
on the training program. To read this training, I've been able to understand how to interpret very large amount of data. So I would recommend this, this program for everyone. If you hear it, make sure you register and come and be a part of it. Um, we were taught so many things. We were taught um, like um, face, how to open a Facebook account, how to open a WhatsApp business, how to hack um, your own phone, someone's phone, and how to unhack so many things. The team from GIFEC paid a courtesy call on some chiefs at the Euphori Penny Fier to seek for traditional blessings upon the initiative before the ceremony. In other news, the Kumasi Technical University is engaging the Swami Magazine Industrial Development Organization to foster academia industry collaboration. It is envisaged to culminate in the signing of an MOU which will allow the sharing of knowledge between the two institutions. The executives of SMIDO have therefore paid a familiarization visit to the Faculty of Engineering and Technology's state-of-the-art workshop at Adakujachi campus. Yes, more in this report. The KSTU's Faculty of Engineering and Technology State of the Art Workshop is equipped with the latest machinery in areas of electronics, automotive, melon, and machine design. Vice Dean of the Faculty, Dr. Prince Osu Ansa, also for the collaboration will be crucial in ensuring effective partnership between the formal and the informal sector for sustainable development. The main aim is to, 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 is to sign an MOU. But as, as I said earlier on, we wanted them to come and see what we really have here. Some of them that doesn't mean that we really have this particular edifice here. Then we have really gone far, but we want them to come and see this particular edifice that we have here. And then we can really sit down. The Vice Chancellor, the PVC are all into this. The Minister of Education is really into this. And then once they see this, we are going to come out with what we think can help them. They also bring yes, and they will sit down and then really sign an MOU, which will really benefit the two of us. We want to exchange uh, uh, knowledge. We also want to also create income generation between our youth and the informal sector. Chairman of SMEDO, Albert Kofi, believes the collaboration will boost particularly Ghana's automotive industry. We are trying to see how best we can, the, 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 the formal sector can uh, collaborate with the uh, informal sector. So now we are being introduced to so many things that they can that can help us for that collaboration. Uh -huh. So from here we are going to also to pick for the pick from here how best we can move on uh, with the automotive or engineering industry. So it's a very nice uh, uh, collaboration. Reporter for Joy News, Quincy Deborah. So that's uh, the you know coach of the Black Stars there uh, speaking to the press. Uh, th they'll be playing Black Stars. Yeah. will be playing on mm, on Friday, Friday. against Brazil. Mm. So um, ahead of the game, you remember Mohamed Kudus has been in good form for Ajax recently. Yeah. Um, he scored six in the last five um, appearances he's made. Okay. And he's done that playing as a false nine. So these performances has raised the question is whether he could be used in that position for the Black Stars. Mm. Um, George asks, you, George is in France. Right. Yes, George asks Otto Ado if it's an idea they are considering. Well, from Otto Ado's own math, it looks like Mohamed Kudus is giving him, uh, him a headache in terms of mm -hmm. where he should be deployed. Otto Ado says the force nine position or the force nine rule is one of the options they are considering for Mohamed Kudus. Um, this is not the first time Mohamed Kudus is playing as a force nine. From Nordjylland, He's, he's, he's been playing there. He came to Ajax. In the initial stages of Ajax, he was playing as a false nine. Uh, and then after a season or two, he comes back to uh, flourish in the false nine position. So it raises the question of whether he's able, he will be able to do it in a Black Stars jersey. We should um, mind the fact that playing as a false nine, you need good players around you. Right. With the crop of players we have currently in the Black Stars squad, it looks like it could work for, um, I won't say it could work, but then it could be an option. And then it could be one that um, allows Mohamed Kudus to flourish. His movements um, of the opposition, his movements prior to the box, is one that um, has helped him a lot. At Ajax, he has the players, he, uh, the kind of players who are able to interchange with him, mm. move into positions, and they allow him to run into space. So if we're able to do the same thing um, with the national team, then it could be an opportunity. 
for Mohamed Kudus to play as a false nine in the Black Stars team. How, how crucial is this game on, on Friday? I think uh, Otuado has said it, George Barton has said it, and Gideon Mensah has also said it. It will show us the level at which we are. If we really want to flourish at a World Cup, really want to do or well, go past the group stage, we need, you need to test yourself against one of the best. And currently ranked number one in the world, um, there's no better team to play than Brazil at the moment. Right. So um, for the Black Stars, yes, there's an opportunity. I, I like the way George Barton put it. He says, if you are the coach, you don't want to test yourself against the best of coaches. But then for the players as well, they need to test themselves against the best players. Because you go to the um, World Cup, you, you face the Luis Diazes, you face the Cristiano Ronaldo's, you face the Fede Valverde's. So it's, it's quite an opportunity. If you're able to prove your worth, well, it means you are ready to go to the World it Cup. It appears the current management, they are trying to stretch themselves, uh, but also at the same time manage expectations. Because I listened to Oreko's uh, interview with, with George, the, Barton. Uh, George Barton, and he indicated that, look, bringing the cup it will be too much of an expectation. But you, you could clearly tell that they're trying very hard to make sure that they put up a very good performance. Bringing the cup is obviously a very difficult thing, but I guess we want to go beyond our last best performance. So perhaps <laughs> reaching the... When, when the, the FIFA draw was, um, the group stage draw was conducted, yeah. the first things that came out of most of Ghanaians was that we are going for revenge against Uruguay. Yeah. Well, we should be mindful that in the last World Cup, we weren't present. Russia, we didn't go. So if we are making everything, we should manage our expectations. Mm. You have Portugal, you have Uruguay, mm. you have South Korea. Um, speaking based on what we've seen in the past years, Portugal and Uruguay are two top countries that you would like to play against. There's a feeling that with the new additions we've made to the Black Stars team, it could ginger us, it could propel us, and then take us to a height that probably previously we weren't uh, thinking of going. But then we should also be mindful that it's a new set of team. It's a youthful team. I think we are taking one of the um, youthful squad to the... We'll be taking one of the youthful squad to the tournament since um, our debut in 2006. So right. we, should, we should try and manage our expectations. Mm. Let's see how that goes. And uh, definitely a revenge will be very sweet against Uruguay. If they can deliver that to us... <laughs> Would love that. Well, right. for, for Uruguay, uh, I think the best person who would have loved that revenge would have been Asamajan. Asamajan himself. It's just, it's just uh, unfortunate. He's but, 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 like but regardless, I mean, once we beat them, I guess that should be fine. Lawrence, thank you very much for bringing us sports thank and you. all the best to the stars, even as they prepare for Friday. And that's it uh, for sports. But that's how we wrap up the show. Many thanks for your company. We have more stories when you log on to myjoyonline.com. I'll be back at midday with news from around the world. Stay with us.